Hey, church family, I miss all of you. As you know, Allison and I are on 30A down in Florida for our sabbatical. I was spending a little time over the phone with Pastor Frank DiMazio. If you remember him, he spoke at a team night not too long ago, and his message is on our YouTube channel, and it's phenomenal, so go back and watch it. But he and I were chatting over the phone a few weeks ago, and he recommended that while I was on sabbatical to film a message and share it with the church. And so on this Sunday, I'm going to be sharing a sermon with you from the archives a little bit. And I hope that's not too much of a bummer because the message that I'm going to share today is a message of the house. I shared it in 2018, and it caught fire right away. In fact, it's become a part of our daily language and culture here at Legacy Nashville, and that is the message of kings and priests. If you were here at the time and remember it, I just want you to go ahead and shout amen for the, from those of you who are in the auditorium. I hear you. I feel you. Come on, you better preach me down today like you would if I was there in person. So we first started with this message, Kings and Priests, during a generosity sermon series. We were talking about finances, and we were discussing kingdom principles, principles like the tithe, principles like offerings, principles like sowing and reaping. We talked about those kingdom principles, and this message of kings and priests is really a kingdom concept, and this kingdom concept did not originate with me. I wish it had, but uh, someone who is so wise and so anointed shared this concept decades ago, and his name is Pastor Mike Hayes. He happens to be my father's pastor, and he's from Dallas, Texas. And through this message, there was another pastor in the room that heard it for the first time and was inspired to author a book. Now, that book, which you've probably read, is called The Blessed Life by Pastor Robert Morris. And so some of these thoughts originated with Pastor Mike Hayes, and I've received them from him through books and podcasts and sermons, and I've taken the revelation that he shared with the body, mixed in some of my own revelation through time spent with the Lord, and I have this message for you today called Kings and Priests. So I want to talk to you about your role in the kingdom of God as a kingdom of priests. So that's where we're going to get started today, and if you don't mind, I'd like you to open up your Bible to Exodus chapter 19. I'm going to kick off with verses 4 through 6 in Exodus chapter 19, and what I'd hope to highlight through this passage is God's desire for you to be a kingdom of priests in the Old Testament. So this is God's desire as read in Exodus 19. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. Everybody say that with me. A kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. This is God obviously speaking to Moses, saying, I desire for my people to be a kingdom of priests. This is God's desire in the Old Testament, that his people would be a part of this sacred group, this sacred family called a kingdom of priests or kings and priests. 
So when you look at the two big words there, a kingdom of priests, you got kings and priests. A kingdom is a sovereignty. That's what a kingdom is. And a priest is someone who ministers first to God and then to others. So God says in the Old Testament, my desire is that my people are a holy nation, a kingdom, say it with me once more, a kingdom of priests. But despite God's expressed desire for his people to be kings and priests, Israel does not comply with the word of God, much like many churches today. We don't comply with the word of God. Instead, we complain to God. So what ended up happening in the Old Testament often happens in the church today is that we end up with only one priest and no kings. And that's exactly what happened to Israel. They ended up with one priest, which was Moses, and no kings. So the expressed desire of the Father for the people of God to be a kingdom of priests was not realized in that moment. But God's desire never faded. In fact, God's desire remains the same today, and we're going to read about that next from the New Testament. So look at uh, the book of Revelation. That's right, we're going there. Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. So it's John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom of priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. We see right here once more, the Father has a desire for his people to be a kingdom of priests and for them to function in, for them to flow in glory and dominion. Now, it's important that you remember that, glory and dominion. Dominion, And so what John is teaching us here is that Jesus loves us so much that Jesus washes us of our sins and then Jesus makes us, he transforms us, he establishes us in this world as a kingdom of priests, meaning kings and priests, and then he causes us to offer unto him both glory and glory and dominion, okay? So remember that, glory and dominion. And you can frame it up like this, is that kings seek dominion for God and priests seek glory for God. So as he's called us as a people to be a kingdom of priests, to be kings and priests, we have kings that are seeking dominion for the Father and then we have priests who are seeking glory for the Father. And this is part of their function. It's part of their assignment. It's part of their anointing. And of course, as God's sacred people, surely we are called to be both. Yes, we are called to be kings and priests. But what I want to submit to you today is I want to help you to better discern which group that you are called to function within in this season of your life. By the end of this message, I want you to know, am I called in this season to be a king or am I called to be a priest? Am I called to function and flow in the gift of offering dominion to God as a king? Or am I called in this season to function and to flow in the gift of offering glory to God as a priest. Yes, overall, throughout our lives, we will function in both, but in each season, we tend to function in one more primarily than the other. And so I want to help you discern which one you're functioning in in this season. Remember, it's not about your identity, it's about your assignment. Are you called to be a king in this season, or are you called to be a priest 
in this season. Now, to further explore which one that you're going to gravitate towards after today, I want to cover what the assignment of kings is more fully, as well as the assignment of priests. So in order to touch on what the assignment of kings are, then I want you to turn in your Bible to 2 Samuel chapter 11, or you can just read it off the screen. I'm going to have a lot of scriptures today. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. We're going to read about an Old Testament king model, one of the best models for what a king is, which is about King David. And in verse 1 of 2 Samuel 11, it says, In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle. Okay, remember that phrase? When kings go out to battle, because what we're seeing here is we're seeing some understanding of the assignment of kings. Kings go out to battle. David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. So what are we learning here about the assignment of kings? The Bible is teaching us that kings go out to battle in the spring. That's what kings do. Kings go to war. Kings go to battle. So if you're the personality type and you're thinking you got some aggression on the inside, you're like, I am called to function in dominion and take territory for God, then you may already be discerning that you are called to lean into your kingship in this season. And this is the job of kings. The job of kings is to go to war. The job of kings is to take back territory that belongs to, to God. The job of kings is to set up conquest of cities and nations and neighborhoods and territories and geographic regions. That's what kings do. And if you continue to read throughout David's story in 1 Samuel chapter 11, yes, we're going to be reminded that he's going to fall. He is going to, um, you know, have uh, intimacy, adultery uh, with Bathsheba. He is going to fall. She's a married woman, obviously. He sees her bathing. He sleeps with her. He gets her pregnant. He then murders her husband. I mean, it's all kinds of bad stuff, right? David obviously sins in a big way. And we're not going to examine that portion of David's story today. But I do want you to recognize that had David been engaged in his assignment as a king, he would have gone out to battle and he wouldn't have been so bored at home as to get engaged with this demonic temptation. He was supposed to be doing what kings do, which is going to war and taking territory. Now we know obviously Nathan the prophet came and rebuked David and gave him the opportunity to repent and he did, thank God. And that's where we're going to pick up on the story in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 29 through 31. It says, So David gathered all the people together and went to Rabbah and fought against it and took it. And he took the crown of their king from his head. And the weight of it was a talent of gold and it was a precious stone. And it was placed on David's head and he brought, he brought out the spoil of the city. A very great amount, the Bible says. Now we're talking about money talking about riches, talking about wealth, talking about spoils, talking about finances. This is another element of what kings function in. And he brought out the people who were in it, and he set them to labor with saws and with iron picks and iron axes and made them toil at the brick kilns. And thus he did to all of the cities of the Ammonites. And then David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. Guys, this here is a good picture of the assignment of kings. This is what took place as David functioned in his kingship after repenting, after doing what he was supposed to do all along, which is go to war to take territory back for God. This is the assignment of kings. The Bible teaches us here that David gathered all the people. That was one of the first things that he did. Kings function in a leadership anointing. They have the capacity and capability to gather people. That's what kings do. They are leaders. Then David went out and he took a city. That's what kings do. They take geographic territory for the Lord. And then gold and precious stones were given to him. This is what kings do. They have, uh, they have the ability and the anointing and the power, the Bible says, to get wealth. They flow and they function with 
money. And he brought a great amount out of the city. And he did this to all of the cities of the enemies of God. This is David functioning in his kingship. But then what does he do? He brings back the spoils of war. He brings back the wealth of war. He brings back the crowns and the gold and the precious stones. And he brings it back to Jerusalem because he had a project in his heart. And that was to build the house of God. And this is what kings do. This is what they're anointed to do. They gather people. They lead. They go out on conquest. They conquer territory. They take spoils from the enemy. They take money and they come back and they bring it back to Jerusalem because they have a God project in their heart to complete. And in David's life, that is the house of God. And that's what I want to encourage all the kings in today is that a part of your kingly calling and taking territory and stewarding wealth for God is that, is that God's project becomes your project. And you don't have to look any further than Matthew chapter 16 to know that God, through Jesus, has a project in his heart, which is to build the church, to build the house of God. And obviously, David would not build the temple in his time, but God would use him to gather all of the materials to do so. So this, church family, is the assignment of kings. And I want you to say this part with me. Kings take territory. Let's say it again. Kings take territory. Kings function and flow in dominion. Kings take territory. Remember that. So now let's move forward to the assignment of priest. And to look at the assignment of priest, I'm going to go to Numbers chapter 1, and I'm going to read verse 47 through 53. This is a good picture of the assignment of priest. But the Levites were not listed along with them by their ancestral tribe. For the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Only the tribe of Levi you shall not list, and you shall not take a census of them among the people of Israel, but appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of the testimony and over all of its furnishings and over all that belongs to it. And they are to carry the tabernacle and all of its furnishings and they shall take care of it and shall camp around the tabernacle when the tabernacle is to set out. And the Levites shall take it down and when the tabernacle is to be pitched, the Levites shall set it up. And if any outsider comes near, he shall be put to death. The people of Israel shall pitch their tents by their companies, each man in his own camp and each man by his own standard. But the Levites shall camp around the tabernacle of the testimony so that there may be no wrath on the congregation of the people of Israel. And the Levites shall keep guard over the tabernacle of the testimony. Now, I know that was a lot of scripture right there, but I want you to just glean a couple of things from this uh, picture that we receive about the assignment of priest, and that is this, primarily this, is that priests take care of the tabernacle. That is the primary function of priests. In the same way that, that, that we said that kings take territory, you can remember this, priests take care of the tabernacle. You guys say that with me, church. Priests take care of the tabernacle. Amen? That's what priests do. Kings, they function and they flow in dominion, whereas priests function and flow in glory. Okay? So for myself, as a priest, I'm a local church pastor. I am a priest. I can identify with a lot of this. There were things that the priests weren't allowed to do. They were not uh, included in the census. They were left out. They didn't have property that personally belonged to them. There were some sacrifices that the priest had to make in order to become priest, but because they had the cooperation and the collaboration of the kings, then the kingdom of God could go forth as a partnership between kings and priests where the kings would bring 
uh, the, the, the territory, they would bring the finances, and then the priest would bring the care for the tabernacle and the worship and the glory, and they would be a symbiotic relationship that would advance the kingdom of God and establish the government in Jesus in any place that the church was set up, in any place that the tabernacle was picked up and then set down. This is a beautiful, powerful, provoking image of what the church is called to do in the cities that it occupies. And so it's important for you to understand your role. Which are you? Are, are you in this season a king or are you in this season a priest? Because it's not about your identity. Remember this, it is about your season, seasonal function. It's about your seasonal assignment. It's what you're called to do. And this is the assignment of priest. Priests were appointed to oversee the tabernacle. That's what they do. Priests oversee the tabernacle. Now, kings do not oversee the tabernacle. I know sometimes in our churches, we think because someone contributes or makes a lot of money or is very savvy in business, then that automatically qualifies them to lead within the context of the tabernacle. But it is not so biblically. It is important that we establish, that we honor, that we respect and admonish the priests that God has selected because their assignment is to take care of the tabernacle and to oversee the tabernacle. They cared for the tabernacle. They carried the tabernacle. What a powerful image. They carried it on their backs. They protected the tabernacle. And most importantly, Guys, they protected the people of God, their shepherds, their pastors, their lovers of people, their encouragers, their caretakers. This is what priests do. So the kings, they operate in dominion, and then the, king, and then the priest, they operate in glory. So priests minister to God for God, but they also do it on behalf of the people. They're intercessors, whereas we see the kings might be business people or statesmen or politicians or financiers. And I want to go a little bit further into Hebrews 5, just real quick, to examine a few of the qualifications that the Apostle Paul points out for the priesthood. So in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1 through 7, it's a lot of scripture for you guys today. Are, are you dialed in? Are you still with me? It's a lot of scripture. Verse 1 through 7 in Hebrews 5 says, for every high priest chosen, remember that, they're, they're chosen by God from among men, is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. And he can deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. I know sometimes we look at pastors as though they are the end all be all. They could never fail. They could never sin. They are so holy. But no, Paul actually gives a different description. He says, no, priests are beset with weakness. I know you guys can't believe that about me, but it's true. I am beset with weakness. I don't have it all figured out. Therefore, as a priest, it is my job to be kind and to be gentle with the wayward. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. You guys remember that? The baptism of Jesus in Matthew. And as he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And that's a, that's a biblical picture of an Old Testament priest, Melchizedek. Obviously Abraham is an Old Testament picture uh, of a king, and we know that uh, when Abraham encounters Melchizedek, what is the first thing he did? He tithes. He gives a 10% of his income and the spoils of war back into the priesthood. You're going to see, th see this throughout all of the scripture. And in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. So, Notice a few things here. Priests are number one. They are chosen. It is not because of their performance. It is because of God's plan. Priests are not perfect. They're not, they're not necessarily deserving of what they get to do, but because of the grace that God has put upon their life, and they are anointed 
to do what God has called them to do, which is to take care of the tabernacle. That's what priests do. And Jesus said, uh, with prayers and supplications, with loud cries and tears is how he served as a priest. And if you ever wanted a good job description for somebody in the ministry who functions as a priest, it is that. Supplications and prayers, loud cries and tears. That's what it's like to be a part of the priesthood. But you know what's great about it? Is that in return for all of your supplications, you get God's glory, which makes it always worth it. So let's recap just a little bit before I help you decide where you're going to lean into today. Uh, kings, they take dominion, and that's what they function in. They function in dominion because they take territory for God. And then priests over here, they function in glory because they take care of the tabernacle of God. And I want you to begin to identify right now. Come on, church. You guys over there. You guys over there. I want you to begin to identify what lane that you're called to run in in this season. And one of the ways you can do it, let me give you a quick tip is I want to ask you a question. It's very important. Listen up. Very, very important. What kind of ideas do you get when you are in the presence of God? Do you get business ideas or do you get ministry ideas? Because that's one of the telltale signs of how God has anointed you to function in this season. When you're in here on Sunday during worship and you lift up your hands and you start singing, what is it that pops into your mind? Do you start thinking about the people you need to move around on your team at work in order to make the organization more efficient and effective? Or do you start thinking about the nonprofit organization that you have a dream about, that you want to give birth to, that's going to help feed kids over in Africa somewhere? You're probably called to be a priest, and if the opposite is happening, you are probably called to be a king. And just because you functioned as a king in one season does not mean that God may not be transitioning you to function as a priest in this season. Some of the most amazing pastors were once upon a time some of the most amazing business leaders. And some of the most amazing business leaders were once upon a time some of the most amazing pastors. So don't shut those people down as though they've been disobedient or doing something that they're not called to do Perhaps God has called them to cross over, and maybe God is speaking to you about that today. So within the realm of kings, you have kings and queens, you have government officials, you have congressmen, you have senators, you have governors, you have mayors, you have councilmen and women, you have business owners, you have entrepreneurs, you have investors, you have strategists. All of those people would fit within the category of kings, and then within the priest. Uh, those who operate within the realm of glory, you'd have the five-fold ministry, you'd have the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. You'd have church planters, you'd have ministry leaders, you'd have children's uh, directors, you'd have Sunday school leaders, you'd have anybody who would function in as part of the church as we know it. That would be within the priestly uh, department here. So I want you to discern your dominant gift. I want you to remember again, it's not about your identity. Uh, you are not defined by what you do or what you're called to do. You're defined by who you are in your identity. God calls you a son and a daughter. He also calls us a kingdom of priests, which is where we must discern our anointing. We must discern our authority. We must discern our favor. We must discern where it is that God has given us power to operate in this season. Are you beginning to discern which lane that God has called you to run in? Are you a king or are you a priest? So if you're thinking right now, I am definitely a king. Let me tell you a few things about kings. Kings bring resources into the kingdom. Let me ask you, answer honestly, are you giving? Are you tithing? Do you self-absorb all of the resources that you are given? Are you selfish or are you generous to bless the kingdom of Jesus, bless the local church, and bless the people of God? Because kingdom kings bring resources into the kingdom. Kingdom kings bring wealth, not just tithe. I know a lot of times we look at the 10%, we're like, 
Well, if this is what I have to do, kingdom kings don't look at percentages as though that is what they have to do. Their preoccupation is not with percentages. They are looking to flow in dominion and take territory for God because they have a project called the house of God in their heart. They really want to make an impact. That's their preoccupation is impact. So if you're stingy, I'm just, I'm shooting it straight to you this morning. If you're stingy, you're not yet functioning in the anointing of being a kingdom king because kings don't hoard, they operate in dominion and that's kings. Now, on the other hand, if you're saying to yourself, I am definitely called to be a priest. Well, what do priests do? Priests take care of the tabernacle. Let me ask you, priest, some direct questions also. Are you actively engaged in taking care of the house? Even if this is not your home church, I'm asking you, are you actively engaged in taking care of the house of God? Because priests are less concerned with consumption and they are more passionate about their contribution. Church is not all about them and their experience. They are coming to church to receive from God and from others for sure, but they are also coming to church to pour out to God and to others for certain. Priest, give. That's what we do. That's what you do when you're a priest. Even if it costs you Tears. Are you serving people in places where it hurts to continue or do you serve simply in the spaces where it's convenient? Because priests, kingdom priests, they're willing to serve with tears. Kingdom priests are not, all, uh, not out all alone uh, by themselves doing their own thing in independence away from the church. And so I know a lot of people think, uh, well, I'm a priest, but they've made their whole ministry out of picking apart the church and lobbing stones at what Jesus is building. That is not the mindset of a kingdom priest. So what are we called to do here once we understand which lane that we're supposed to run in? We are now called not to compete, church, but to collaborate. We're called to come together and work together to, to advance the kingdom of Jesus. Kings go in conquest. They receive dominion. They bring back provision into the house of God. Priests go into prayer. They receive glory. And they bring back vision to the house of God. And so you've got kings that collaborate with priests. The kings bring the provision and the priests bring the vision. That is how we collaborate. It is a divine working together that God has designed from the Old Testament all throughout the New Testament into Revelation that us as a people of God would function as a kingdom of priests. Now, lastly, before I pray for you, I do just want to hit on this, is that so oftentimes we fall short in honoring one another for what we are called to do. A lot of times we've made our kings, our entrepreneurs, our business people, our people who feel called to pioneer into politics, we've made them to feel less than or somehow unspiritual because they feel called to flow in dominion and carry great wealth. A lot of times the priest or the church folk or the religious folks they have looked at kings and they've said things like, man, if you'd ever really get saved, if you'd ever really pray, if you'd ever really fast, if you'd ever really get spiritual, then you'd, get it, you'd give all of that away and you'd go be a missionary somewhere in Africa. No, if God has not called you to do that, if he's called you to be a kingdom king, then we bless you to go out and to do what God has called you to do. You may not always be able to be here on a Sunday morning. You may need to take an early flight to go sign a business deal somewhere, and we bless you to do that, to function in the way that God has called you to function. You don't always have to be in the tabernacle. That's the job of the priest. Now, I don't want you guys to get me wrong. Sometimes business folk are like, well, I'm not called to be a priest, so I'm going to stay home on Sunday and binge watch on Netflix. That's not what I'm talking about, and that's not the mindset of a kingdom king. If you're in town, if you're here,
here, you're in the house. You're worshiping God and you're blessing other people as a kingdom king. But if you need to do what God has called you to do, not to be here every time the doors are open, we bless you to function and to flow in the dominion that God has called you to flow in. On the other hand, if you're called to be a priest, I know sometimes society and culture and everything that we see on social media puts pressure on the priest. You know, if you're going to be in ministry, you're going to be poor. You better get out there and make something of yourself. I can't believe you're going to shut yourself up in the church all the time and, and, and serve within the context of a nonprofit organization. You're going to end up a failure. You're going to end up in poverty. You're going to end up on food stamps. And they kind of feel less than because, well, you know, I'm just a lowly minister. I'm just an ordained pastor. I'm not really anybody special. I don't have some... Great education, I don't make some seven-figure salary, therefore I'm not as important. No, we need to repent to the priests in the same way we need to repent to the kings. This is not about competition and comparison. This is about a divine collaboration. We must move into a space where we trust our priest to bring vision from the prayer closet, from the glory of God, to bring vision to the people of God. We must trust our kings to be commissioned and released, to go out and take territory and to function in dominion and to bring the provision back to the house and together with both kings and priests, we divinely collaborate to advance the kingdom of Jesus here and now, so for those of you guys who feel called to be kings, just go ahead and put your hand up right where you are, even if I can't see you because you're watching on a laptop or a phone, okay, God sees you. If you're called to be a king, I want you to put your hand up in the air right now, okay? So for those of you guys in the room at Legacy Nashville Church, if you're called to be a king, I want you to stand up in the room right now. You know I'm talking to you. Stand up, okay? We're going to pray for you. For those of you who feel called to be a priest, you, you stay seated, but I want you to begin to pray for the kings right now. Kings, we just want to repent to you right now in Jesus' name for in any way we've tried to control or manipulate you or to cause you to feel less than spiritual because of what you are called to do by God to function within the sphere of business and government and education and everything that you're called to do. We bless you in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray that the anointing would increase over your life, that the favor for finances would increase over your life, and that God would continue to raise you up as a voice in this hour to move forward and to flow in dominion and to take territory for God. In Jesus' name, and the church said, amen. Now, if you feel called to be a priest, I want you to put your hand up in this season. If that's you and you're in the room, I want you to stand up. If you're watching on the couch somewhere in another nation, put your hand up. Come on, let the Holy Spirit see you because as we pray for you today, something is going to shift in your walk where you feel clarity and permission to do what God has called you to do. Lord, I also want to repent to the priest where we've tried to uh, push you down or somehow cause you to feel bad about the position that you've taken that God has truly called you to. You are exactly where you are supposed to be. And while you may not do what the kings do, you're getting paid in love. You're getting paid in glory. You're getting paid in being able to witness the transformation that God has called you to participate in. And we bless you. I pray for an increase of the anointing upon your life. I pray for more encounters. I pray for more vision. I pray for more dreams. I pray for more strategy that comes from the presence that God would begin to speak to you more about launching that nonprofit, about starting that food program, about planting that church and doing what God has called you to do as a priest. I bless you. I pray for you. I declare that you are qualified by God to walk in what God has called you to walk in in Jesus' name. Priests, go ahead and stay standing in the room. Kings, let's go ahead and stand up with them because what we're going to do now is we are going to stand as a united front and we are going to declare to all of hell that we are in unity and we know that unity always precedes great moves of God. Look at Acts chapter 2. He is not, the enemy is not going to tear us apart, but we're going we're gonna to function in our strengths and we're going to honor one another's strengths as we move forward. So Lord, I just thank you for this house. I thank you for this church family. I thank you for this kingdom of priests. I thank you for these kings and for these priests with glory and dominion that they're going to function in. I thank you for helping them to identify where they're called uh, to function strongest in in this season and all of the guilt 
and all of the shame and all of the confusion fall off of them now in Jesus' name as they go forth to do a mighty work for God. I bless you guys in Jesus' name. I miss you. I'm going to see you here in just a couple of weeks. Please continue to pray for us as we, ha as we have our rest time and recoup time uh, on our sabbatical. And I just want to invite uh, whoever's hosting today to come on back up and to wrap us up. I will see you guys soon, Legacy. I love you, family. Cannot wait to be back. Hug your necks. Get in church together. Be blessed.